Well, I've already spent about nine hours complaining about how awful Fallout 4 is. How much else could I possibly say? As it turns out, a whole hell of a lot more. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. This is the third part in a series of videos analyzing and critiquing Fallout 4. I highly recommend watching the first two parts before this one, but it's not necessary this time. Part 1 was about the first half of the main story, and Part 2 is about the second half, involving all the faction paths up to and including the end of the game itself. Additionally, I talk about many of the side factions present in the game as well. In this part, I will be talking about quests and questing in Fallout 4, as well as companions. As can be expected from this topic, there will potentially be spoilers for Fallout 1, 2, 3, New Vegas, and naturally, Fallout 4, as well as Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim. With that out of the way, I'd say let's get to it, but as you can see from the footage, I'm already into it, and what it happens to be right now is a little thing called Radiant Quests. Trust me, I've been wanting to rip this shit apart since the first second of the first video. Rather than simply explaining what they are first, I'm going to show you. You get the quest, kill some monsters, return for a reward. You get the quest, collect an item, return for a reward. You get the quest, help a settlement, return for a reward. Kill some enemies, get reward. Kill a monster, get reward. Kill some raiders, get reward. Radiant quests. They f***ing suck seven different kinds of crusty asshole. A Radiant Quest is the antithesis of what questing should be in Fallout, or even in an RPG in general. A Radiant Quest is quite literally the epitome of mindless busy work. Bethesda reintroduced these with Skyrim and brought them back with a vengeance in Fallout 4. These quests are a f***ing plague, a disease upon the RPG genre. The entire point of them is to keep you busy doing repetitive and pointless tasks that serve no purpose but exists as a generic vague thing for you to do endlessly. Literally. As in the actual dictionary definition of the word literally. Many quests in a game can be reduced to kill thing or get item if you strip away all the other important aspects of it. But there's nothing more to strip down here. This is the absolute most bare bones a quest can be outside of literally updating quest markers with no character interaction or dialogue. In fact, this is so bare bones it basically is that, except you need to talk to someone for a reward, and in some cases, to even start the quest in the first place. Radiant quests select a random location for you to complete an objective. The type of objective usually depends on the source of the quest. For example, one of the Brotherhood of Steel NPCs gives out Radiant quests to clear random locations of whatever enemies are set to spawn there. Ghouls, raiders, super mutants, it doesn't matter. It's just a meaningless task. Some want you collecting pointless items that were made and only exist to be objectives of these quests. Some want you to help another settlement. Preston Garvey gets a lot of shit for his whole another settlement needs your help routine, but the entire f***ing game is like this. The Brotherhood, the Institute, the Railroad, they all have these types of quests in droves, and that's on top of them existing in the world in other ways, like the job board in Diamond City. As I explained previously, the majority of the Minutemen's quests are made up of Radiant quests, so they are the worst of the bunch, but it's not an isolated case. Bethesda tries to shove this mechanic in elsewhere too, quests that are semi-radiant, quests where they can take place in any number of random locations, yet have semi-specific objectives, like the Railroad's quest to kill the members of the S&M gang, raiders who specifically hate synths and try to kill them. The extent of the design of these quests is shoving one extra NPC into a random raider base, otherwise it's all generic nameless enemies. Or how about Preston's quest to go help settlements who are being harassed by enemies that are on the complete other side of the map? This can also lead into quests where you're told a settlement needs help, but they just send you to clear out another settlement for some friends of theirs, which are just more generic nameless NPCs. This nets you two settlements for the price of one. I don't know if it's been fixed or if it's still possible, but you can potentially get the same location consecutively while doing these quests. I have no intention of trying to get it to happen for the sake of gathering footage, because I'd f***ing lose my mind if I had to do it, but I remember it happening back when I first played. 
seller got kidnapped from one of my settlements, I cleared out the raider base and finished the quest, got another one of another kidnapped settler who was in the same raider base as a captive, while all the raiders were still dead from my last visit. And this happened multiple times. Even if you don't believe me on this one since I don't have video evidence, it was a common complaint people made early on, so you could just go look it up. Radiant quests are a worthless stand-in for what should be better content, but the most egregious and worst implementation of this is when they shove them into faction quest lines and are mandatory if you wish to complete those factions. Rather than designing a unique and potentially interesting quest, which can either be a contained story or part of the greater narrative, they shove this garbage into a quest line as worthless filler, and it is absolutely not a solution to pacing issues in a quest line. It is the epitome of laziness when it comes to designing an overarching storyline or quest line. They did this in Skyrim too, and it was just as bad there. I think it's good quest design to break up a big storyline with contained smaller side stories, or to build up your status in a faction by doing smaller jobs before moving on to the main plot of these factions. But Radiant Quests are not the way to do this. By having them here, like this, we lose out on the individual quests that fill out a faction's list of jobs for you to do. Take, for example, the Fighter's Guild quest, Emelion's Debt from Oblivion. It's not the best quest ever made, and it probably isn't even too high on the list for Oblivion's quests, but it's still a quest that was thought out and designed, and it had the added bonus of a set of armor that has a unique appearance. Sure, it's essentially a quest to just go collect an item in a dungeon, but it requires someone to plan it out and write reasons for it to exist within the world. As compared to a Radiant quest in Skyrim or Fallout 4, which has you completing a generic objective in a random location as a requirement for continuing down a faction path. Having a defined character motivation gives extra weight to the situation and is more engaging than there's a den of enemies that I'll never visit that I need cleared out, let me mark it on your map. Another thing I hate about these quests is the vagueness of character dialogue. I know it's a result of being random and they can't possibly record lines for every potential outcome, which isn't actually an excuse for this issue, since these quests absolutely should not exist anyways. Either way, it results in strange dialogue exchanges like... We've got a nest of some nasty bugs just around the corner. If they don't get cleaned out soon, we're gonna have a real problem. What's really too bad is it'd be a nice spot for a new settlement. In fact, I know some folks that would love to set up there if it was safe. If you can make sure the old workshop there is still in one piece, Anyone who decides to move in later will be able to rebuild. Where is this place? We have a pretty good idea. I hope you can find them and wipe them out. It just comes off as really weird, jarring, and annoying. And it still feels like your character is psychically being fed information that isn't being spoken. Compare this with quests from even other Bethesda games. Then allow me to explain the task. The Council of Mages has entrusted me with resolving a situation along the Gold Road. Several traveling merchants have been found dead along the Gold Road recently, with even more missing. The Council has asked that I put a stop to it. You are going to help me do so. We believe the killings are the actions of a rogue mage. Battle mages have been sent to the Brina Cross Inn, the only common link between the victims. You are to travel north to the Brina Cross Inn and speak with Ariel Gerard. She will give you further instructions. Rest here for the night, and then continue along the Gold Road, heading east towards Kavach. I shall be following out of sight, along with a fellow battle mage. Make no attempts to speak to us. Trust that we will protect you. Should you be confronted by this cowardly mage, do not hesitate to protect yourself with whatever means possible. Once the mage has revealed himself, we will step in and settle the matter quickly. Now get yourself some sleep. You'll need to be well rested. Where is this place? We have a pretty good idea. I hope you can find them and wipe them out. They're worse than daily quests in an MMO, Simply for the fact that at least daily quests have some kind of objective you're slowly trying to build towards in most cases. Radiant quests are the bottom of the barrel as far as content goes. Generic objectives, repeated infinitely. 
It isn't even a step up from spawning enemies in Gmod and shooting them. It's really no better comparison. Bethesda makes these so they can brag about how their games have infinite quests that you could play Skyrim or Fallout 4 forever and still have things to do. And that is the inherent problem with Radiant Quests. An infinite loop of self-generating garbage will never have the depth or complexity of well-written, handcrafted quests with a narrative and deeper goals. Their kill quests and item retrieval quests in other games are more engaging because there's a narrative reason for doing these objectives. Bethesda seems to have forgotten that and have come to the conclusion that an NPC marked as an enemy is good enough reasoning. This problem is made exponentially worse as even with their handcrafted quests in Fallout 4, there isn't much to them. The perfect example of that is the railroad quest from the previous video, Tradecraft, in which you go into the railroad's former headquarters to retrieve an item called Carrington's Prototype. This object simply exists as a quest objective and nothing more. There is zero point to it. It's nothing. Irrelevant. A game model shoved into the world to be an objective. What does it do? Nothing. They never say. It's just a thing that exists. Does it have any relevance to future quests? No, it isn't ever used for anything. It isn't a key component for a greater objective. It doesn't alter the stakes of any situation. It doesn't provide any benefit. It isn't a danger if it falls into enemy hands. It quite literally does absolutely nothing at all. You collect it. Turn in the quest. It's removed from your inventory, and therefore the game, and it's never seen or mentioned ever again. This item is so fucking irrelevant, the Fallout Wiki's entire page for it is as bare bones as bare bones can be. It is a quest item. It looks like a stealth boy. It's only found in a switchboard during Tradecraft. End of fucking story. Compare this with, oh, I don't know, the fucking platinum chip from Fallout New Vegas. It is also just an item you have to retrieve, but it has narrative importance. It isn't just a poker chip made out of platinum, it's the key to upgrading Mr. House's robots. Most of the major players in the game want this chip for one reason or another, including, potentially, the player themselves. And so this item it kicks off the entire game in the first place. The opening scene is literally you getting shot in the ah! f***ing head over it. Or, hell, even compare it to the Gek in Fallout 2 and 3. It's another object for you to collect as part of a quest, but still has narrative importance. In Fallout 2, the Gek is used to save your village of Arroyo, and in Fallout 3, it's used to help purify the water or... something. Carrington's prototype is a vague nothingness that does nothing, has no reason to exist, isn't ever used for anything, and has no use in the first place, has no story significance, lacks any and all kind of value, and no one cares about it outside the forced belief that's important enough to the railroad to risk squaring off with Institute forces that nearly wiped them out at some point in semi-recent history. The only point to this quest is to maybe show the player that the railroad doesn't exist within a bubble, and the fight against the Institute really is a life-or-death situation for them that could turn south at any moment. But the significance of that has already been undercut by their stupid fucking password. I don't even have to use major examples such as the Platinum Chip or the Gek to make this point either. In Fallout 4 itself, there's quests that have you retrieve items that are used for objectives later on, or have a particular use for a faction. It might not be clear why I'm emphasizing this so much, so let me explain. The idea that you risk your life for a supposedly extremely important object that is never used for anything and has no purpose is utterly ridiculous. By giving these items meaning, it makes it feel as though you're building towards something. You're advancing towards a goal. In the Brotherhood path, Liberty Prime needs high-powered magnets, nukes to use as weapons, and the Beryllium Agitator to get functioning again. There's a progression. The stakes change as you gain a giant fuck-off murder bot that no one without an orbital cannon can harm. While I don't think these quests are the best, it's still at least a progression towards a goal. If there's no meaning behind these objectives, nothing to gain, no progression to make in any direction, no stakes that are changed as a result, then it ultimately feels like a waste of time doing it in the first place. It's a meaningless, mindless objective that serves no purpose. You're just playing errand boy with the fucking blinders on, unaware of any wider impact, goals, or stakes because there are none. 
Now I'm going to deviate a moment into a creative solution for this problem. Character's prototype can very easily be given any number of uses important to the story that would give this item narrative value. For example, it could be explained that it's used to disable tracking devices and synths, or maybe it could disrupt the Institute's control over them. You could design numerous quests around testing and applying these uses for the benefit of the railroad. Imagine if it could be used to scramble a courser's brain just enough to want to choose freedom, and maybe even fight against the Institute. That would be a pretty big advantage to the railroad. Actually, it would be a game changer, especially if it could detail coarser fighting tactics to the railroad so they can more effectively counter them, which in turn could lead to more coursers being turned. The Institute would be losing their shit in full-on panic mode as their top operative is dead and coursers are being turned against them. This could even lead them to being so desperate as to invent new and extremely deadly weaponry as a result, thus raising the stakes. Alternatively, you could sabotage it if you decide to betray the railroad, or, hell, maybe even steal it for the Institute so they can learn from it and either find a practical application for it themselves or counter the railroad making and using one in the future. These are all just random ideas I came up with off the top of my head while writing the script. And even if you don't necessarily think these are good ideas, at least it's still better than fucking nothing. So all this brings me to a question. What is the point of a quest? If the answer is simply stuff for the player to do, then Radiant Quests succeed at what they're intended for. I vehemently disagree. I'd say a quest is one part objective for the player to complete, and one part story and or story progression. Generic stuff, with no meaning, isn't very engaging, is it? How long can you collect random pointless items because a character says it's important, and that's the end of it? On the other hand, if we wanted a story without interaction, we'd just read a book, or watch a movie, so it isn't solely story progression. The obvious answer is that a quest or a mission in a game is an interactive story, which, depending on the game, you might be able to influence the outcome. Yes, I realize I'm talking about the basic f***ing concept of what a game is, but apparently we've reached that point, because by the very definition, Radiant Quests lack any kind of meaningful story, narrative, or progression. Clearing out Super Mutant Layer number 256 on its own is a meaningless task, no matter how much nameless NPC 581 shouts, OMG, they are dangerous! Especially since they all just respawn and you're not actually making the Commonwealth any safer. And before anyone goes into the comments saying that some Radiant Quests need to be completed to progress the storylines, that's not what I mean. At that point, they're an artificial barrier to the rest of the story that supplants what should have been a properly developed and thought out quest is still just mindless busy work, even when it is forced into quest lines. When I say there's no progression, I mean nothing is learned or gained from doing them, and the story isn't advanced in any way. Destroying Mariposa military base because the vats of FEV are there, and that's where the master second in command and his followers are converting humans into new super mutants, puts more urgency, motivation, and reason on the task. Meanwhile, Super Mutant Layer 347 is just a location full of super mutants. They're bad guys, so go kill them. Story gives the objectives meaning. You're doing these things for a reason. Collecting a family heirloom at the request of an Ashlander to gain their clan's trust in Morrowind, and therefore progression in the main story, has more meaning than, there's a piece of rare tech in, location name, go get it for me. Which I remind you, is a required Radiant Quest in the Brotherhood Path. Helping an escaped slave? Find a man who helps escaped slaves? Only to find out the slave you were helping was really an undercover assassin hired to kill the man, is a story contained in a single quest, and it is far more interesting than some raiders captured one of our old model synths and are keeping it prisoner? What the fuck? How the wow. fuck is this even an issue? The Institute has teleporters and knows where this thing is. Why can't they just teleport it out? Why the fuck do the raiders even care about keeping this thing captive? Wouldn't they realize this just puts them in greater danger? Just when I thought I was done talking about the Institute's problems. Fuck you. I can't stress this enough, but Radiant Quests are meaningless in every conceivable way. They're just this generic ball of tasteless mush, and the fact that Bethesda seems to think this is quality content is not only an insult to the people who play and love these games, 
but it's also an insult to Fallout's legacy as one of the best role-playing game series of all time. This would be like the equivalent of taking a beloved IP like Silent Hill or Metal Gear and reducing them to shitty gambling machines, or taking Star Trek and turning it into dumb action schlock, or taking Star Wars and undermining quite literally everything that made the original trilogy so great. See, I've talked about how I think Bethesda doesn't care about Fallout. It's not just Bethesda's willingness to trample Fallout's lore, but their willingness to strip away everything that made Fallout great in the first place, shoving the iconography everywhere they can to please mindless fanboys, like jingling a set of keys in front of a toddler. It's the exact same fucking shit Star Wars is doing. Which brings me to the next point. The actual design and written quests don't fare much better. Fallout 4's quests are fundamentally flawed because they're cheaply designed, poorly motivated, and horribly written. I don't think there's any truly good quests in this game. A mediocre one is the exception, not the rule. And most often, you'll find yourself trying to dodge radiant quests like the ah! f***ing plague, because when a character has run out of story relevance, half of them turn into radiant quest dispensers if they weren't ones already. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a radiant quest and a handmade one, and that certainly isn't a compliment towards the radiant quest system. Most of Fallout 4's quests are so boring, generic, and lackluster that you've got to wonder if the writers and quest designers were taking ah! f***ing horse tranquilizer during development. Most of Fallout 4's quests are quite literally collect item or kill enemy, with a little more on top of it, and only rarely a quest will break that mold, only to be complete trash anyways. Like the one where you help a guy fix some leaks in a water pump, and last less than a minute. Even then, they felt the need to throw some enemies into the mix. Everything is just about shooting things. This bottom of the barrel lazy fucking trash should be rejected. Kill quests and collection quests aren't inherently bad on their own, but if that's all a game has to offer, especially with the legacy Fallout has, then there probably isn't too much depth to the design of these quests. Many of the quests in Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas were about dealing with people in some form or another, be it solving conflicts or helping them with problems that are more involved than murderizing something or collecting something. Even Morrowind, which is primitive by today's standards because it was way more limited, and it still has more developed quests than Fallout 4 does. As always, I feel a comparison is the best way to get my point across. In Fallout 2, when you reach Vault City, the leader, First Citizen Lynette, gives you the job of shutting down the nearby Gecko power plant. As it turns out, a bunch of ghouls have taken up living there and have restored the plant to working order to provide themselves with power. Problem is, the reactor is damaged, and Vault City's water supply is being contaminated with radiation as a result. This quest can be dealt with in numerous ways. Firstly, you could just wipe out all the ghouls and shut down the power plant. You could simply fix the power plant. You can fix and optimize it, resulting in excess energy. You can fix and optimize it, resulting in excess energy, and letting the right person in Vault City know about it, Though this one is apparently bugged and doesn't show up. You could just not do this quest and not fix the power plant. Or you could be a total thunder ah! to blow up the nuclear power plant. There are numerous different ways to solve this quest, and each one requires different actions or steps taken on the part of the player, and they result on different outcomes. A story is being told that you have an effect on. It isn't killing generic enemies or collecting a random item. In Fallout New Vegas, the quest, Oh My Papa, the player has to deal with the Great Contribe. Naturally, you can just wipe them out. You could obtain the support of the leader's advisors to break the alliance with Caesar's Legion. You can out the Legion's emissary in front of the Con leader. You can make the Con enter into an alliance with the NCR instead, if you assassinate the current Con leader. In Morrowind, an Ashlander chief wants to marry the daughter of a powerful Telvanni wizard something that such a wizard would never allow. He doesn't care who she is, as long as she's related to the Telvanni. What you end up doing is buying a slave and dressing her in fancy clothes in order to trick him. There's a process that's planned out by a character to make this trick work. In Fallout 4, you get a quest where you tell a cat to go home. The complexity, depth, and choice are the fucking meat and potatoes of Fallout quests, and for whatever reason, Bethesda completely lacks the ability or desire to design interesting 
and memorable quests, and their creativity in most cases seems to only go as far as kill thing or collect thing. The only reason I find any of Fallout 4's quests memorable is either because I found them infuriatingly stupid, annoyingly boring, or I had to do them numerous times for the sake of this fucking analysis series. If I had completed the game back in 2015 and never played it again, and if none of these issues bothered me so much, Fallout 4 would be a complete void in my mind. I'd know I've played it, but I wouldn't be able to remember a single detail about it. Now there's probably a number of people watching this who are immediately going to assume that I'm cherry picking here, and you'd be absolutely right to make that assumption. The cat quest is probably one of the absolute worst quests in Fallout 4 that isn't a Radiant quest. That said, as far as Fallout 4 is concerned, I've got a hell of a lot of bad cherries to choose from, and I'm going to go ahead and pick every last goddamn one of them. That's right, I am now going to talk about every single marked non-miscellaneous quest in Fallout 4. I will be excluding the main story, as I've already talked about that extensively, and I'll be excluding Radiant Quests because they're fucking Radiant Quests. What else do you expect me to say on the matter? Banished from the Institute. This quest is literally just you getting kicked out of the Institute and maybe getting a stern talking to. It happens when you do something to piss them off and they permanently exile you. Basically, it just exists to account for that happening and isn't an actual quest with any kind of objective to complete. Cambridge Polymer Labs. A bunch of scientists got locked in their lab after the bombs dropped and couldn't get out until they finished making a new piece of power armor. You finish the work they started by following their instructions and combining the right chemicals to create the armor. This is one of the few quests that actually requires you to read anything and isn't just solely about shooting things or collecting items, and as such, this is actually one of Fallout 4's strongest quests. This would have been far more interesting as a quest if your science skill helped in completing the quest, and the power armor piece you make could vary in quality depending on how well you solve it, instead of being completely unable to attempt to make it with the wrong materials. It's basically impossible to fail, because it won't run if you don't have the correct materials. Curtain Call Super mutants are using an actor as bait at the top of a building. Rescue him and his super mutant friend and ride a bunch of elevators to the bottom while killing more super mutants. Vault 81. The overseer asks you to get three fusion cores for them to allow you entry. Hole in the wall. A kid is sick from a mole rat bite with a unique disease. Acquire the cure from the secret second half of Vault 81. It's literally just a dungeon, and the gimmick is you can't allow yourself to get bitten by the mole rats, as if there's only one cure. However, the only negative effect of this disease is a permanent reduction of 10 health points. You have the choice to save the kid or use the cure on yourself if you're bitten. This is also where you find the companion, Curie. The cure is located in the secret half of the vault. As it turns out, this vault was split into two, one side being disease researchers trying to find a cure to diseases, and the other side being unaware test subjects. Dependency. A guy is addicted to Jet, and you're asked to help him beat his addiction. You can convince him to get help, you can give him Jet and fail the quest, or you can be aggressive with him, which can cause him to attack. Here, kitty kitty. You find a fucking cat and tell it to go home. Short stories. You tell some stories of your adventures to school children. Vault Diddy 1, Hole in the Wall, Dependency, Here Kitty Kitty, and Short Stories are all quests based around Vault 81, making it a complete void of suckage, so it's the perfect microcosm of this game as well. In Sheep's Clothing The mayor of Diamond City loses his shit because he's afraid his status as a synth will result in his death. He takes his secretary hostage, you can optionally heal a guard, or get help for him. There's three options for McDonough. Kill him, allow him to leave Diamond City, or have him stand trial, which results in him turning hostile and getting killed anyways. The only real consequence for this quest is not acquiring the Diamond City player house if you don't already own it, and if the secretary is killed. Speaking of which, this kept bugging out on me and Piper started attacking her for some reason. Kid in a fi- Oh, god damn it! Mystery meat. 
A man runs a business selling canned meat to the wasteland, but it's been making people sick. Do a dungeon to find out he's selling ghoul meat. This is part of that super obvious, it was cannibals trope. Listen, anyone who plans on writing a post-apocalypse story of any kind, if you're going to have any sort of story or quest based around a mysterious or suspicious meat food product, don't fucking make it human meat. It's the single most obvious fucking thing you can do. The whole silent green as people was shocking for its time, but not anymore now that the idea has been beaten 12 miles into the fucking ground. Bethesda seemed to try and mix it up by making it ghoul meat, but at the end of the day, they're still f***ing human. Just horribly mutated and irradiated humans. There's also an option where you can partner with him, but that doesn't result in him changing his business at all and there's no way to do so. The only way to get him to stop is to kill him, of course. Order up! This one is a tad more complex due to actually having a few options to solve. But it's still an extremely simple quest and only really lasts a couple minutes at most. A chem dealer has come to collect a debt from Trudy's son. Talking to Trudy and the dealer results in four options. Kill Trudy and her son. Kill the chem dealer and his bodyguard. Convince Trudy to pay the debt or threaten the chem dealer to leave. Finally, a quest where you could solve a conflict between two opposing groups with multiple ways to solve it and it's over and done with in a single minute. Fucking wonderful. Out in left field. The guy who sells baseball bat weapons at Diamond City thinks the point of baseball was murdering people in an arena. He wants the collector's items from the ruined house of a coach from before the war. This literally isn't even a dungeon. They're just three containers that are otherwise completely out in the open. Painting the town. Collect a can of green paint and paint a wall. It's literally just a really small dungeon with a couple of enemies. You can bring back either blue or yellow paint, or you can mix them to make green paint. It literally only takes a few minutes. This quest gives new meaning to watching paint dry, but at this point I'd prefer it to this fucking piece of shit game. It's also mentioned that this store is the only source of paint. Considering they've been keeping this wall painted for 200 years, you've gotta wonder how the store didn't run out of paint after the first few years. Pikmin's Gift. Do a dungeon to find a guy being held up by raiders. Turns out, he's a psychotic serial killer who... kills raiders. I guess? You can either kill the raiders, or you can kill the raiders and Pikmin. Either way, you get a key to a safe that gives the same reward. There's no chance to side with the raiders, you can only kill them, and either let Pikmin live or kill him too. Public Knowledge! Kill a bunch of super mutants in a dungeon and return an overdue book. Pull the plug. Turn three underwater valves so a guy can drain a quarry. Kill some Mirelurks because reasons. Noticing a pattern yet? If you return here later, it turns out he's the leader of a raider gang, and they're using it for a base of operations, but that's after the quest ends, and there's no more quests related to them. Story of the Century. Answer some questions for Piper. No, really. Really. That's really it. The Devil's Do. It's literally just a spooky dungeon with a death claw at the end. They establish a horror atmosphere, but it's just a death claw. It's not something new and interesting. Maybe this would be more threatening if we didn't mow one down with extreme ease at the start of the game. You can either return the egg to the death claw nest, or you could take it to some dude who hired the gunners to do this job in the first place. If you return the egg, the death claw will actually be neutral to you and even somehow give you a Deathclaw Gauntlet weapon. What the fuck is this Disney bullshit? The Disappearing Act. After rescuing Nick in the main story, some quests open up through his detective agency for you to complete. This relates back to what I said in the last video about Missed Opportunity. There's so much potential here, you can do so fucking much with this. Entire in-depth quest lines. But all they have is two small shitty little quests. In this one, a guy has gone missing. You search through some extremely basic clues that lead you to the basement of the Diamond City Doctor. Turns out his assistant, or whatever, went mad and killed the guy. You can either kill him or talk him down, which results in him killing himself. Thank you for this meaningful choice, Bethesda. What I found annoying about this is the fact that everyone is acting like this guy was missing for days, or even longer, and still just a fresh corpse in the basement. And Dr. Crocker is losing his shit as if he just killed the guy, 
And as far as investigating goes, you really only need one clue to lead you to the Diamond City Doctor. The Gilded Grasshopper! This is Nick's only other detective quest, and it's just as shitty. An adventurous former partner of Nick is on a job! Surely these two characters reconnecting will lead to great adventures, right? Nope, he's fucking dead! Go to location, find item, go to other location, collect reward. And that's it! That's the amazing, wondrous, fantastic, engaging, in-depth, interesting, exciting, well-developed, and truly awesome extent of Nick Valentine's Detective Agency quests. It's honestly surprising they didn't turn this into a Radiant Quest dispenser too. Just infinite detective quests that are rescuing an NPC from a raider camp, or killing some scumbag that's harassing folks. The Memory Den this quest literally just exists to account for the memory den before the player is supposed to reach it. If you paid to relive your memories, it just takes you back to the kidnapping of Vault 111, because we really need to see that scene three fucking times. And Irma might refund you for reliving that traumatic experience. You're then directed to Nick and Diamond City for the main story. Trouble Bruin. Do a dungeon for a special microbrewing robot. Either send it to Good Neighbor, or keep it for yourself, and send it to one of your settlements. Vault 75. Do a dungeon. That's it. That's literally it. You complete the quest when you read the Overseer's Terminal and learn about the Vault Experiment. Here there be monsters! A Chinese sub from the war is immobilized, and its entire crew is ghoulified. The captain wants to get it up and running again. Collect an item from a dungeon, and collect an item from the lower decks of the sub, which is full of feral ghoul crew members. Despite fixing the sub for him, he'll never actually leave. The Last Voyage of the USS Constitution This is usually referenced as one of the better quests in the game, and I will admit, it's better than just about any other quest in the game. It might actually be the best one. As it's a multi-stage quest, and two groups are in conflict, it's still pretty dumb though. Basically, a bunch of robots went mad and think they're part of the U.S. Navy, and are trying to launch the ship into the sea, so they can defend the Atlantic coast of the USA. This requires helping them repair a bunch of mechanical issues with their ship, and fending off scavengers who want to scrap all the robots and everything on the ship. Surprisingly enough, this quest actually has something akin to skill checks. Most of the mechanical problems can be bypassed with a high enough intellect, and each mechanical issue requires progressively more intellect to complete without getting the spare parts. It glimpses into an alternate universe where Fallout 4 was a bit better designed than what we really got. It's like this one quest got swapped here from that universe and they got our shitty version of it instead that has no skill checks and is all about killing a monster in a dungeon and collecting an item from that dungeon. Anyways, you have to retrieve a part from the scavengers. They try to make a deal with you, where you betray the robot so they can be scavenged. This doesn't come into play until near the end of the quest, when you get a part for the rocket which they can sabotage. If you side with the scavengers, they'll kill all the robots and immediately betray you and try to kill you. If you side with the robots, the scavengers will spawn several waves of nameless NPCs to attack the ship. It's also worth noting that these scavengers are just basically renamed raiders as though they're all wearing raider gear. Once that's done, you'll launch the ship and they fly off into the distance and crash into a building. This is just more of Bethesda's obsession with making everything in Fallout wacky, weird, and stupid, just like the superhuman gambit and blood ties from Fallout 3. The Big Dig You're recruited into doing a heist on Diamond City's vault. You kill some Meyer lurks and Bobby's two accomplices will run away in fear. She sends you to Diamond City, where she actually explains that the job you're doing is a heist. She needs you to free an old partner of hers from the Diamond City Jail. Once you do, it's back to the dungeon. A robot will clear out sections of the wall for you, and in each newly revealed section of the dungeon you have to kill a bunch of enemies. First Mirelurks, then Feral Ghouls. You reach the area under the vault and blow it up, only to learn it's Hancock's vault, and his men are in there waiting for you. Bobby admits the deception, and wants you to kill Hancock's men. You can either kill them, kill Bobby, or talk her down. If Bobby is talked down or killed, Hancock becomes available as a companion. During the dungeon section of this quest, Mel will voice his opinion that he doesn't think they're going the right way, but there's literally no other option. The Silver Shroud 
A ghoul that runs a radio station dedicated to the comic book hero Silver Shroud wants to bring the character to life and fight crimes in Good Neighbor. He tasks you with collecting the costume from a dungeon, then has you kill a bunch of randos who are doing objectively evil things, like murdering innocents and selling lethal drugs to children. He announces his targets via radio, and you leave a calling card on the bodies. After you kill a few bad guys, the two of you gain the attention of a horrible gang leader who wants you both dead. He kidnaps the ghoul dude and holds him hostage as bait for you. Do a dungeon, kill some generic enemies, and the big bad. If you save Kent, he'll basically give up. Even if you convince him to continue, he never will, since this is the end of his quest. Diamond City Blues This is actually kind of one of the slightly more well-developed quests. It still isn't great, and what choices you have here are somewhat limited, but certainly a step in the right direction, and that at least deserves a bit of credit. Paul Pembroke thinks his wife is cheating on him, but he gets his ass beat down. Later, he'll approach you and ask for help. He returns to the bar to confront Cook with your help. Alternatively, you can go alone on his behalf. Either way, this leads to a confrontation with Cook. This results in either him dying or being spared. If he's killed, you get a note on his body about a drug deal that you're going to crash. If he's spared, he'll tell you about it and bring you in on it. Upon reaching the meeting place for the deal, you kill the drug dealers. The leader of their little group might surrender. If you interrogate her, she'll give up details on the drug lab. If she dies, there's a note on her body. Either way, this leads to the fish packing plant, which has a secret room where the drug lab is, and that's the quest completed. The point of the hidden drug lab is to give a reward to the player, but there actually isn't much in there. Amazingly, another quest may or may not become available, depending on who lives or dies in this quest, which was a shocking thing to learn. But this quest is also another example of just how incompetent Bethesda is at writing. If you keep Cook alive and crash the deal with him, he gets absolutely nothing out of it. He doesn't get anything from the people we kill, no caps, none of the chems. He just assists the player, and possibly Paul, for absolutely nothing in return, and leaves forever, even though there's no actual reason for him to do so. He puts himself in danger for absolutely nothing in return. He does mention he was planning on skipping town for a while, but that doesn't explain anything. He could just leave town without angering a violent gang. The Morowski Heist If Paul dies in Diamond City Blues, his wife will ask you about it in Diamond City after a few days. Sometime later, if you go talk to her, she'll say she found an old photo of Paul, Cook, and Malcolm Latimer. As it turns out, it's an incriminating photo that ties them to a massive drug heist that nearly ruined a gang leader. The actual goal of the quest is to either blackmail Malcolm for money, or hand the picture over to Morowski and kill Latimer for him. Let me just say, it was pretty f***ing annoying to even get this worthless f***ing quest to be available, and apparently there's sometimes further trouble with it. Either way, considering it's a quest with heist in the name, no actual heist takes place, which would have been far more interesting than what we got here. Confidence Man This quest is actually surprising for the fact that it has some kind of notable impact on the world, and that is the entire personality of the Diamond City radio host being changed as a result. There's still issues with this quest, but it is arguably one of the better ones in the game. A drunk Russian man wants Travis to be more confident. The way he thinks he can achieve this is by forcing Travis into a fight that he will win. He hires a couple of goons who will take a dive in a bar fight and wants you to help Travis. I don't know if the game was bugging out on me or what, but it always had this really awkward way of starting where the goons would walk in, Travis would walk in, and Travis would start acting like they were already harassing him when they hadn't actually said anything yet. Come, have a drink. I didn't buy bar to sell water. <clears throat> look, look, I don't want to be in trouble. Oh, what's wrong? Not so tough once you're not on the air. You tell him. But, but, what's this about? Oh, what's wrong? Not so tough once you're not on the air. Ho <laughs> ho! Can you just, can you just leave me alone? Oh, what's wrong? Not so tough once you're not on the air. You tell him. But, but, what's this about? 
Oh, what's wrong? Not so tough once you're not on the air. Oh dear, she's stuck in an infinite loop, and he's an idiot! Also, the first time I tried this for the video, it wasn't clear where the fight ended. Because I threw one too many punches, they turned hostile for real, which caused Travis and the drunk Russian to pull out guns and murder them, then I got chastised by the drunk Russian for murdering the goons. Get lost! Travis. Oh, jeez! Hey, Vadim. What the hell is wrong with you? You were supposed to help Travis in fight, not murder people in my bar. Why would you think this is okay? Anyways, you beat them and they get all pissed off and promise revenge. Even though they knew they were paid to be in a fight and lose. Drunk Russian isn't done yet, though. He wants you to hook Travis up with the waitress that works in his bar. You can go convince her, and return to the bar, at which point you find out drunk Russian dude has been kidnapped by the thugs. How did they manage to kidnap this guy and get him out of town without the guards noticing? Don't think about it. It's not important that this major plot event happens when it should be impossible. Travis wants to go save him from the thugs and asks you to come along. After killing the goons and rescuing drunk Russian, he rewards you with ah! shit he somehow stole from the thugs, even though he was tied up. Speaking of Travis, you find out his voice has changed entirely, which is kind of jarring and weird. Hi. Man, what a day, huh? Hey, listen. I wanted to say thanks. This has been... Well, it's been crazy. But I've learned a lot, I think. I hope so. I'm tired of that shitty, whiny attitude. Yeah, yeah. I know. Also, if you talk mad shit about Travis to his face, it has no impact on the quest. Another thing to note is the fact this quest is entirely linear, with no real choice on how to handle anything. I suppose you could kill the goons in the bar fight, but it still changes a little. Overall, this quest is lacking in many areas, but it is kind of one of the better quests in Fallout 4, though that isn't saying much as the bar isn't really that high. Human Error if there's one thing I really enjoy, it's a good investigation and mystery. Yeah, this isn't that. They try to make an investigation angle, but it ultimately ends up being very lackluster at best. And there really isn't a whole lot to this quest. You investigate the destroyed caravan and find lemonade there, that is sold by the robot in Covenant. You can ask around on Honest Dan's behalf, which raises the suspicion of the townsfolk, who all refuse to say anything on the matter. You can find a bunch of vague clues that ties the caravan to Covenant, such as the Lemonade, but we already know there's a connection, so it's kind of weird. It doesn't really advance anything. The only clue you really need is the fact that they have an underground compound across the pond. There's a couple ways to learn this. Even if you haven't talked to anyone in the town about the caravan, once you learn of the compound, some guy will try to convince you to drop the case. Even though he should have no way of really knowing, if you're actually investigating it at all in that situation. You could tell Honest Dan, or not. Either way, it leads to doing a dungeon. You can either pass a speech check to be escorted through, or you could fight through. But regardless, it ends in a confrontation with a mad scientist who believes a kidnapped girl is a synth. You have three ways to solve this. Either side with Covenant and kill Honest Dan and Amelia Stockton, in which case you learn she really was a synth, which is ah! fucking ridiculous that they even managed to get that right considering their way of determining who is or isn't a synth is with the f***ing goat test from Fallout 3. Yeah, real f***ing creative there, Bethesda. Your Blade Runner reference fucking sucks. Writings. Bad and you should feel bad. You can side with Honest Dan and kill the mad scientist and free Amelia, which turns all the Covenant humans hostile towards you. And finally, if you didn't bring Honest Dan into the dungeon, you could personally bring Amelia to Old Man Stockton at Bunker Hill. Again, it seems they tried to do something here, but fell short. The Secret of Cabot- Oh, motherfucker! <sighs> if Fallout 4 is a black stain upon the reputation and legacy of Fallout, 
then the Secret of Cabot House questline is a black stain upon Fallout 4 itself. While I will give credit for the fact that Bethesda actually added in a semi-developed and detailed questline with recurring characters and a story for it, and they should absolutely do more quest designs like that, what they absolutely shouldn't do is add f***ing Eldritch Cthulhu bullshit and magic to a f***ing Fallout game. Ever. The story behind this questline is that this family has been living for hundreds of years through a serum made from an extract of the blood of Lorenzo Cabot, the head of their family. He was an archaeologist, and during the 1800s, he discovered an ancient lost city in the Arabian Desert from before human civilization. There, he found an artifact. This weird crown thing he wears, which made him go insane, but also gave him great powers. Now that's all the backstory that you learn during the final quest of this quest chain, which is really only three quests, Special Delivery, Imogene Takes a Lover, and The Secret of Cabot House. In Special Delivery, you're recruited as a mercenary to help find a stolen package, tracking it from the insane asylum, where it was being delivered from. As it turns out, it was stolen by generic raiders, instead of a potentially interesting and developed opposing faction of some kind. You recover the mysterious serum, and you can either keep it or hand it over. And that's about the extent of it. In Emogene Takes a Lover, you're tasked with recovering Emogene Cabot, who has a habit of running off with random men. This results in an overly easy investigation that leads you to a weird cult where she's being kept, and once there, it's really not all that hard to free her. You can pick the lock, kill the morons for a key, or pass a speech check. Back at the Cabot estate, Edward, the head of their guard, is heard over a radio fighting off raiders at the asylum, and Jack, who is currently running the family, starts the final quest, The Secret of Cabot House. On the way to the asylum, he gives you the info dump about the magic alien Cthulhu crown, and about the Cabot family having lived for hundreds of years. The asylum itself is a huge dungeon, and is actually one of the slightly more interesting ones in the game. Upon reaching the basement, where Lorenzo is being kept, you learn the raiders are trying to free him, and they've released enough of the security measures that kept him locked down that it's now impossible to contain him. You have two options. Either kill him, which ends the Cabot family's supply of immortality juice, or you could free Lorenzo, who now wants to murder his entire family. You can either defend the family, or assist in killing them, or just let Lorenzo kill them. If Lorenzo wins, he gives you an infinite supply of the Immortality Juice, which is really just a stat-boosting item, and you can only have one at a time. If you kill Lorenzo, Jack Cabot will give you a shitty gun made from the crown after a week. Now there's a few common themes you should be noticing here through most of these quests. Many of them are very short, and the longer ones usually involve a dungeon. Most revolve around a simple task, killing an enemy, or collecting an item, or doing something like telling stories to children, or revisiting the kidnapping scene from the start of the game. Very rarely is there any sort of conflict to solve between opposing groups, and the few times there are, it's short, and often overly simple. There's a lot of stuff to do, but very little of it has any substance or meaning, and this is why they blend in with the Radiant Quests. If a Radiant Quest has you killing a random super mutant in a random dungeon, and public knowledge has you killing a bunch of random super mutants in a specific dungeon, and dropping off an item, there really isn't much difference now, is there? It seems as though the point of the quests in many cases are the dungeons themselves, rather than the dungeons being a means to an end. What do I mean by that? Well, with Fallout 4's quest design, it seems like the entire point of them is to run you through a dungeon, just like the Radiant Quests. As if Bethesda thinks that dungeons are substantive content, or a substitute for a narrative or developed story. If anything, the fact that they think Radiant Quests are substantive in the first place is evidence of this fact. In previous games, the quests involving dungeons were more about the lore and stories being told, or providing some kind of challenge beyond mowing down dozens of enemies charging at you. This even includes Bethesda with Morrowind and Oblivion. Sure, there've always been dungeons that were just holes in the ground with enemies and loot in them, and that's fine. But most quests involving them often had a story to tell or a progression in the narrative. The dungeon was only an obstacle to your goals, but it wasn't the goal itself, nor was it the purpose of the quests. With most of the quests here, 
It feels like Bethesda didn't know how to expand upon them, instead just threw their arms up in the air and said sticking in a dungeon. That's not to say the other games didn't have simple or bad quests, nor is it to say that simple quests are bad quests. There's nothing inherently wrong with a kill quest or an item collection quest. Hell, that's the main goal from the start of Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas. The problem is that a large majority of Fallout 4's quests fall into these categories, and many of the ones that don't are either overly simple or short. Order Up is a good example of that. One of the very few side quests in Fallout 4 that actually involves two opposing groups, and it's a quest that's over and done with in just a minute or two. I look at Fallout 4's roster of quests, and I can't help but ask why do many of these exist as full-on quests. It seems as though they are trying to fill out the available list of quests without really providing anything substantive. Why does Order Up, Hear Kitty Kitty, Short Stories, Banished from the Institute, Curtain Call, Dependency, Out in Left Field, Painting the Town, Pigman's Gift, Pull the Plug, Story of the Century, The Memory Den, Vault 75, and Vault 81 exist as full-on named quests when there's barely anything to them. In previous titles, even Fallout 3, some of these would just be an encounter you'd see upon visiting a place, or they would be an unmarked quest purely for the game flagging that you had done something. Take Vault 81, for example. Get three fusion cores to gain access to the vault. Why is that a named quest? If anything, it should be an unmarked quest at most, simply to account for the player being granted access to the vault. You can even still keep the requirement of payment to gain entry. The only real difference is that it pops into your quest log and artificially increases the amount of quests in the game. Same with short stories. You're just talking about your adventures to children, which could have been done as a scripted event, or, hell, even just a set of dialogue options. Vault 75 has you trudge through the entire dungeon, simply to reach a terminal that info dumps the lore. Cool, we're learning more of Vault Tech's dastardly shenanigans, but why is it a quest when such things have been handled better in the past, it's just areas to explore and learn about? Again, even Fallout 3 did this better, with Vaults 92, 106, and 108. Holy hell, I'm referencing Fallout 3 as a positive? What has the world come to? To use another example, Pull the Plug is literally just an unmarked quest lifted straight out of Fallout 3. In Megaton, a guy asks you to repair the leaky pipes in town, back when Fallout still had a skill system. You had to find the three leaking pipes and repair them. With Pull the Plug, you're searching for the three valves that are expelling air, and you turn them. The only difference is the fact that Bethesda tried to spice us up a bit by throwing two Mirelurks at you after the fact. Do some menial tasks and kill some generic enemies. That's the name of the game here, folks. But that also conveniently brings me to my next point here, and also brings me back to the dungeons being the point of the quests, rather than simply being a means to an end. Many of the longer quests amount to doing a dungeon to reach an objective, and doing a dungeon just means killing a fuckload of enemies. They don't do anything interesting with them. Here there be monsters, hole in the wall, human error, mystery meat, the miscellaneous quest that leads to Pikmin's gift, public knowledge, the big dig, and the secret of Cabot House. Any of these quests could have been expanded or made more interesting very easily. The big dig is a good example of this. You've got a somewhat good start with recruiting and freeing a guy from jail. You even have multiple ways to get him out of jail. Hey, that's a really good start. But, oh, the majority of the quest is just mowing down generic enemies in a straight line. Okay. Why did it have to be this way? You could have designed a cool Ocean's Eleven type heist, bring in specialized characters, turn it into a quest chain with a lot of build-up, maybe even find a way to involve Hancock, so a player has a lot of interaction with him before the heist, so once finally revealed that it's his vault you've broken into, there's more of an emphasis on the hard decision of siding with Hancock, or betraying Bobby, the person you've worked with for the past several missions. And obviously, by involving Hancock, I don't mean have him be a part of the heist team. There could be other ways to get the player to have enough interaction with him for this to work. Similarly, with public knowledge, you could develop a faction of super mutants so that aren't orcs in a permanent blood rage. You know, kind of like how super mutants were before Bethesda gained ownership of the franchise. Give them a good reason for being there, build a conflict somehow between them wanting to remain at the library, 
and Daisy, or even some other group wanting to get rid of them, but make neither side objectively good or evil. So it's up to the player's morality to decide which way to handle it. But no, I guess we just have to violently murderize everything in sight. I'm not saying there shouldn't be combat or violence in Fallout, but what I am saying is that the scale is definitely tipped too far in the wrong direction. It shouldn't necessarily be the default solution to damn near every problem you encounter to just shoot them. Enemies were meant to be an obstacle to your goals or threats to show how dangerous the world is now, but they weren't necessarily the goals themselves. The Master in Fallout 1 is your enemy, sure, but there's more to him than simply being a bad guy. Proving to him that his master plan is futile breaks him, and you put an end to his plans without firing a single bullet. It is such a strong scene and a satisfying conclusion to a game, and nothing like that can or will exist in Bethesda Fallout as it is now. Fallout used to be about the character interactions, the world, and the lore, opposing factions and problems to solve. Now it's largely about finding an excuse to kill everything in sight. Look, if I wanted to play Doom, I'd fucking play Doom. In fact, I do play Doom when I feel like playing Doom. If I want to sit down and play a game with a good story, interesting characters, and deal with situations in satisfying ways that doesn't necessarily involve clearing a room of people with a minigun, well, I can't do that with Fallout 4. Fallout 4 presents you a situation with two opposing groups and, oh wait, it's done in a single minute. Not even any effort involved. Even this could easily be expanded into something with more depth. Make Trudy's Diner be a part of a town have Wolfgang be from another settlement unrelated to this one, and to really add to the situation, make Wolfgang be a sympathetic character, give him a family he's trying to take care of, make him resent having to sell drugs to folks. But it's his only way to make a living right now. When he's on the job, he has to put on this act that he doesn't care how much it's ruining other people's lives or even killing them, but it's killing him inside to keep up the facade, all in order to support his family. Maybe his family doesn't know he's doing this. Maybe he's living a double life in order to protect them, and design it so there's numerous solutions to help resolve the situation in any number of ways. You can even keep the existing solutions in the game as some bad endings to his story if you didn't put in the effort to properly deal with things and get a bad end as a result. Looking back at Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas, all of them had kill quests and collection quests, sure. But they also had quests involving opposing groups, conflicts that needed to be resolved, stories to tell, mysteries to investigate, and of course, choices to make. This is truly some of the best content Fallout has to offer, and is arguably at the heart of what Fallout games should be. Your choices in GI Blues have radically different outcomes based both on your choices in this quest and which faction you side with for the main story. It has impact and outcome. There's nothing like this in Fallout 4. Your choices in the Ghost Farm quest from Modoc in Fallout 2 decides the fate of two towns and all the people who live there, whether they form an alliance and survive, or both towns end up dying out due to stagnation and a lack of food, or having one town slaughter the other, which ultimately results in both towns dying out. Your choices shape their future, and you get different endings based on that which Fallout 4 lacks entirely. As explained in the previous video, Fallout 4 has one generic end cutscene with a slightly altered intro for the Institute path. There's no impact or outcomes from any choices you make. No end slide detailing what long-lasting effects your actions have on the wasteland. Nothing to tell you how the railroad survived and helped synths, or how the synths suffered if the railroad is destroyed. Nothing to tell you how the Institute bettered or worsened the Wasteland based on your choices. Nor how the destruction of the Institute impacted the Commonwealth either. Nothing to say how people are relieved that they're gone. Nothing to show another nuke going off worsened things in any way, shape, or form. Nothing to say that the Brotherhood made the Commonwealth safer. And nothing to show their tyranny and control made people miserable. Nothing about innocent ghouls and maybe even super mutants being genocided by them. The game not only fails to provide significant feedback of how the world changes because of your actions, but in most cases, it fails to provide any sort of feedback at all. There's no choice in the outcome of your companions, there's no detailing how you alter their lives, 
there's nothing except the choice of faction, which is largely meaningless and some superficial choices that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Killing Lorenzo Cabot or allowing him to escape, it doesn't matter, there's no real difference. Letting Pikmin live or killing him, does it change anything? Does he make the wasteland safer by killing raiders? Are the raiders emboldened by his death? Nope. It doesn't matter. It changes nothing significant. This is yet another aspect of what many people, myself included, are talking about when we say Bethesda has stripped everything out of Fallout that made it what it was. They've reduced a deep RPG that had choices and developed conflicting groups a game that went so far as to explain how and why the FEV worked, and how it was developed, down to a dumb fuck action shooter game that can't add a new piece of lore without tripping over itself, has token RPG mechanics at best, and largely revolves around endlessly gunning down generic enemies, an experience that can be had in many other games. Bethesda was supposed to be better than this, and Fallout deserves better than this. But at this rate, it's unlikely we'll ever see a good Fallout game ever again. The alleged success of Fallout 76 made sure of that. It's the ultimate testament that no matter how poorly a game is made, no matter how little story it has, no matter how much it fucks up the lore, no matter how far removed it is from the core of the series, the brand loyalists will more than make up for any fans lost due to Bethesda's sheer incompetence with this IP. Fallout 76 is about as far away from Fallout as you can get. All that remains is apparently all Bethesda even cares about. The title and the marketable iconography of the series. This obviously isn't a Fallout 76 video, but I feel it's relevant to my point. Bethesda has been dumbing the series down from the moment they acquired it, and it seems they don't intend to stop. There have been small improvements in other areas, but that's a topic for another time. Now I have thrown an awful lot of criticism towards this game, and I'm far from done. However, there are some positives to mention, but unfortunately this next topic is a bit of a mixed bag, as what positives they come up with are saddled with even more issues. Since the first game in the series, Fallout has had companions, and they become a staple of the franchise. Companions have ratioed complexity from pack mules with guns to full-on developed characters. In Fallout 1, companions were little more than an extra character to help you in fights. This was developed a bit further in Fallout 2, with the ability to control and arm your companions to a degree, and there is a whopping 14 potential companions as compared to Fallout 1's 4 companions. Many of these companions had prerequisites, such as completing quests or certain tasks, and not being the absolute scum of the earth. Some of them had a bit of a story for them as well, such as Sulek, who is searching for a sister who is kidnapped and sold to slavers. And unfortunately, that's kind of where the story ends. It's not resolved in Fallout 2, which is something that annoys me to no end. Point is, there seemed like there was greater emphasis on building these companions up a bit. Fallout 3 had eight possible companions, two for evil karma, two for neutral, two for good, and two with no karma requirement. Most have a bare minimum of a backstory, such as being a slave, being a retired raider, being an apparently cybernetically enhanced Brotherhood Paladin, being a brainwashed mercenary, or being an eccentric warbot. They all essentially function as a little more than a turret with a backpack, with no associated quests or character development when you get them as a companion. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I wouldn't call it good either. They help you kill enemies and they can carry extra loot for you. New Vegas really changed the game with its companions, and this is yet another reason I refer to New Vegas as the gold standard of how Fallout games should be, because New Vegas handled it better than any other game in the series at this point. Much like Fallout 3, New Vegas introduces eight companions. However, unlike the previous games, these are fully developed characters with personalities, personal quests, and the ability for the player to influence their outcomes by the end of the game. They even had companion perks. These personal quests range from the revenge of a kidnapped and killed wife, and dealing with the past, to influencing a Nightkin's medicine dosage, to the investigation of trade caravans being destroyed in a conspiracy, 
and most of these quests result in different endings each character can receive. Prior to New Vegas, only Fallout 2 had shown companion endings, and even then it was only for two companions, who only had one ending each. Marcus travels east, and Myron is killed later, ironically by a jet addict, and his accomplishment in creating a deadly drug is soon forgotten. Now like many people, after the success of New Vegas, I had hoped that Bethesda would have taken a few lessons going forward in the Fallout 4, and make it a truly amazing game. Considering this entire video series has been mostly negative so far, that unfortunately wasn't the case. However, it seems not all lessons were lost on Bethesda, and they did improve companions. Somewhat. Fallout 4 has the second most available companions coming up short behind Fallout 2, by just one. But it's a quantity over quality issue here. While each of the companions have something of a personality, and an actually detailed list of liked and disliked actions, which blew me away to find out. And while they did take some functionality from New Vegas, they're still a bit lacking. I've already gone over the fact that Fallout 4 has no proper end slides, so I won't rail on that subject for long here. What I will say is that there does seem to be a hint of them leaning into that direction, before what I assume is a total abandonment of it. Most companions remain the same throughout. However, there is an exception to that rule, and her name is Kate. She starts off as a chem addict with a troubled past, but as you travel with her and raise her affinity level, a quest unlocks that can allow you to cure her of her addiction. She actually has something of a character arc, and it's really a shame that more characters in this game aren't as well developed, especially when it comes to companions. Carrie gets a new body so she can learn better, Dance learns that he's a synth, and... That's more or less the extent of it. Some of the companions do have a personal quest that allow you to learn more about them, or help them with a problem, but again, this is limited and doesn't apply to every companion. In this way, it feels as though this is something they had started working on and just dropped halfway through development. I obviously can't say for certain, but that's really just the impression I get. Companions with personal quests which are based on their affinity level, are Kate, Curie, McCready, and Nick Valentine. A grand total of four out of the 13 available companions, which leaves Codsworth, Dance, Deacon, Dogmeat, Hancock, Piper, Preston, Strong, and X688 with no personal quest. At the very least, I could possibly understand Codsworth, Dogmeat, and maybe X688 not having their own personal quests, but the rest absolutely should have them as well. Of the characters that do have quests, if they were developed further and had some choices involved, it could potentially end in a scenario where they each get their own end slides detailing how they've changed and live the rest of their lives based on your actions, much like in New Vegas. In the last video, I described how the Triggermen as a faction could have been expanded upon and I detail a potential scenario that involves you influencing Nick's actions and personality in one way or another, and that idea applies here too. The level of depth and choices with these companions would be a massive plus for the game, and if this one aspect were handled better, I'd absolutely hold Fallout 4 in higher regard than I do now. It would still have issues with everything else, no doubt, but I could have at least pointed at this aspect and praised it for being done well. Instead, it's another clear sign of lost potential, and I honestly think that might be worse than just being outright bad. Because with lost potential, you can see the bare glimmer of what could have been great, but isn't. Bethesda might have learned something from New Vegas as far as companions go, but their implementation of it ends up being half-assed and superficial at best. It just ends up being another case of if this was all you were going to bring to the table, it would have been better to have not shown up at all. Continuing with Nick as an example, and I'll bring McCready in too, neither of them experience any change due to their quests. Nick is exactly the same before and after his quest, even though his quest was all about his struggle of self-identity and putting the past to rest. In the end, he's just the same guy we met in Vault 114. Same goes for McCready. We complete his quest and deal with some gunners and get medicine for his son, and that's just about it. Bethesda took partial lessons from Obsidian here. They gave a few companions quests, but didn't develop most of them any further. Nick's struggle is one that could have a lot more depth 
and the ability to influence him, but just ends up being one of the dumbest item collection quests in the game and killing a dumb cartoon character. Companions often end up being incredibly obnoxious and intrusive, too. More so than the standard blocking your pathway. Many have unique lines of dialogue for certain locations, which is a really cool thing. The boat, it is on the building. That is the USS Constitution. Mon dieu. But I don't need to hear it 300 fucking times when I'm repeatedly visiting an area for a quest. Especially if they're talking over a character I'm trying to actually listen to. The boat, it is on the building. It looks quite defensible. Captain. Trim the power on the starboard bow. Steady as she goes, Mr. Navigator. Luck willing, at long last, we'll set sail. And our hero of the hour is to thank. You've earned a double share, madam. Yes, I get it, Kiri. It's the USS Constitution. It's in a defensible position. That's super fucking cool. But it was the last dozen times we visited it as well. You can fucking stop talking over the guy trying to give me instructions now. There might be some valuable stuff inside. Let's go check it out. Now before we get down to business... Edward, switch to single sideband modulating! Can you hear me? Edward, switch there over might be some to the Hartley stuff modulator. Inside. Do you Let's copy? Go check now. Yes, I get it, Kate. We could steal some shit from this place. But as you can see, I'm in the middle of something. Fuck off! It's just so unnecessary and annoying. They could have easily designed this so the companion spouts their line once, then remains silent. Approach the USS Constitution. Kiri says her one line one single time, and never does again. Because she doesn't need to. Because we've already heard it. But worse than that, is when the companion decides they want to talk to you for whatever reason. You've raised your affinity level with them high enough and it triggers them to talk with you. This is cool, it almost makes them feel like more of a real person, except it actively drags you away from what you're already trying to do. It actually forcibly moves the camera against your control, like you literally have to fight it to prevent yourself from being forced to look at them, and it is so goddamn obnoxious. When I first started this series, I had Piper as a companion, and I hit that trigger while in Kellogg's hideout in the middle of ah! f***ing combat, and she kept trying to pull me away from fighting. Unfortunately, this footage was lost after my hard drive died, shortly after the release of part one in this series, but this is still an issue that happens and it's f***ing awful. This extends beyond just the companions too. It's more of an issue with the dialogue system itself. An easy example of this problem is when you first meet Sean, but this happens whenever a character wants to talk to you. This is so intrusive, that it will constantly re-engage dialogue and actively stop you from shooting. Now since I'm talking about quests in this video, I might as well finish off what little is left. Benign Intervention Kate seeks to cure her drug addiction. Take her to Vault 95, clear out the enemies, and let her use a magic addiction curing machine. It's never explained how she knows about Vault 95 having a magic addiction cure. She just knows. Also, when you discover the hidden room of Kim's, she comments on it, basically saying, Dang Vault Tech up to their dastardly shenanigans again. So is it common knowledge among Wastelanders now that Vault Tech performed experiments on people? I could understand more scientifically minded characters knowing this info, but Kate is a rando junkie at best. I wouldn't even mind if the world was more properly developed. It would make a lot more sense if civilization was being rebuilt. You know, kind of like it was in Fallout 2 but far more developed, so people had explored many of these places already, and knew the dark secret. But here, this line comes off as a clumsy wink and nod to the player. If vault Tech's experimenting is so well known, then shouldn't characters in the Wasteland be reacting with surprise at seeing a Vault Dweller that survived their vault? Same goes for Vault 81. Wouldn't Outsiders be very cautious even if it is active? Well, the experiment is deadly, and hasn't been completed yet. I'm getting a tad bit distracted here, so let's get back to the topic at hand. The residents of this vault were all recovering drug addicts, except Vault Tech's inside man. They had been clean for five full years, with absolutely no access to drugs at all. But the moment some appear, they all lose their shit and start killing each other and everyone dies. 
If that's really the case, then why does the magic addiction curing machine work on Kate? Even if it cleans the toxins out of her system, wouldn't she be more susceptible to falling back into addiction than the people who are clean for five full years? Furthermore, when she starts this quest, she gives a sob story about how many drugs she's taking, that she even takes them behind your back when you're not looking. But that conflicts with the fact that she will actively approve if you do take drugs, so why would she need to hide it? When I recorded this footage originally, I had actually streamed it, and some folks in the comments even gave ideas that would have made this quest better. Instead of having Kate magically know about the vault for no reason, have it so she interacts with Kiri and learns from her. Because some vaults did have info on other vaults. It would add another level of depth to these characters if they could be influenced in some ways by other companions. Emergent Behavior Kiri wants to transfer her consciousness into a human body so she can learn better. Take her to the memory den to acquire a blank synth body and just wait for the process to complete. That, that's all it is. Long Road Ahead McCready wants revenge on the guys who harassed him for leaving the Gunners, so you find them and kill him. The second half of this quest has you fetching the cure from a dungeon to a horrible disease his son has back in the capital wasteland. Again, that's all there is to it. Long time coming. I talked about this one in the previous video, but here it is again anyways. Nick wants to take revenge on an old world mob boss from before the bombs dropped, due to his memories being those of a real pre-war cop. Collect the seven Chaos Emeralds, open the door that somehow hasn't been busted down in 200 years, and kill the villain in a box. And that's it! That's every single quest in the game! From the first half of the main story in Part 1, to the individual faction paths and their side quests in Part 2, and the major side quests and all four companion quests here in Part 3. The only thing I didn't cover were the unmarked quests and the miscellaneous quests, which, believe it or not, suck even harder than all the worthless bullshit quests I've talked about up until this point. I also didn't cover each individual possible objective for Radiant quests, but I mean, come the fuck on. If I have to do another fucking Radiant quest, I swear to fucking god the only one I'd want to do is the one where I slash my fucking wrist so I don't have to do any more Radiant quests. But that's it. That's all the quests in the game. That feels like an underwhelming conclusion to what is supposed to be the substantive content within this game, but that's what Bethesda gave me to work with. One of the big problems with these quests is that they are so shallow that there just isn't a whole lot for me to say on them one way or the other. But that's all for today. Thank you for watching.